Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Rhea Thomas, and as was just mentioned, I'm the Managing Director of Polina Advisory. And I'm very excited that we are joined today by a panel of incredible experts to discuss something that is incredibly topical, which is whether the pand pandemic has shifted attitudes towards the use of technology with their balance. So before I introduce our panel, just a quick note. Please go ahead and share your questions. We should have some time towards the end of the session to respond to at least some of them. And with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists. First, we have with us the Information Commissioner for the United Kingdom, Elizabeth Denham. Commissioner Denham has over 15 years of experience in data privacy, including as the Information and Privacy Commissioner for British Columbia and Assistant Privacy Commissioner for Canada. Since 2016, she has been overseeing the UK's Information Commissioner's Office. The ICO is the UK's regulator for data protection and information rights. In addition, Elizabeth also brings an international perspective as she chairs both the Global Privacy Assembly, which is the premier forum for data protection authorities, and she also chairs the, the governance working group of the International Conference of Information Commissioners. Welcome, Elizabeth. And in addition, we also, have, we also have the privilege of having with us Nima Elmi, the head of government affairs for the World Economic Forum. Nima leads a team of global experts, global policy experts, who are responsible for working with governments alongside the private sector, civil society, and academia to co-design and pilot new innovative approaches and governance of emerging technologies. She has written and spoken extensively on the impact of technology on a range of topics from innovation in government to the changing nature of international relations. As a qualified lawyer, she has worked as a political strategist in governments for governments in East Africa, as well as the African Union, as well as in investment banking. Welcome, Nima. And in addition, we, hi, we also have the privilege of having Sir Mark Rowley with us, the chairman of Hagalas. In this role, Sir Mark provides his expertise on international security and policing and advises several GovTech companies who are assisting on policing and security agencies. His expertise is rooted in multiple decades of national security experience, including leading the UK's counterterrorism policing and representing the police with the National Security Council. He was also assistant commissioner of the Metropolitan Police and was also also led Scotland Yard's combating terrorism, excuse me, combating of organized crime and fraud and major police operations. Those are only some of his experiences. And so I want to say thank you and welcome to all of you for joining us to share your insights today. So as you all know, with regard to COVID-19, this has presented an unprecedented challenge for governments across the world. And multiple governments, in order to try to meet the expectations that have been placed on them, the requirements, if you will, the obligations they have to contain the spread of this pandemic, to be able to, to actually make sure that uh, general safety is, is actually ensured, has turned to the use of technology. And in the process, as an example, last Thursday, the United Kingdom has launched the NHS COVID-19 app, which since then has been downloaded over 12 million times. Now, in spite of this use of technology, there have been some critics who have come out and said, where does it stand when it comes to privacy? Not just in terms of the COVID-19 app that NHS has, but in terms of how these types of surveillance-based technologies may be more widely deployed with the justification that it is for the national good and for the safety of the public. I just wondered, I know that, that uh, Elizabeth, if I could turn to you. Now, obviously there are a lot of misconceptions about what this technology is or what it could be used for. And uh, at the same time though, the, the, the critics I think are raising the point that anonymized or not, are we living in a brave new world where governments are using the, or justifying the use of surveillance technology for the greater good? And in that case, from your perspective, what should be the, the principles that are guiding the regulation of the, this type of um, technology, not just national track and trace, but just in broadly, more generally speaking, how should governments go about in the deployment of these types of technologies? Yeah, I, in the UK, we are fortunate that we have a principles-based law, that the law is technology neutral, and that there's a pragmatic regulator um, working on these technologies alongside of government and, and businesses. But obviously today and in many other fora at this moment, we know that the use of the technologies and the use of data is not a short-term matter. 
And I think at the very beginning when our office and others were looking at the privacy implications of the taste and the test and trace system of the application, we were focused on how will it be decommissioned at the end of the day. And that, that was a, a real focus. And I think now we know that data and digital is going to be um, a foundation that's used to mitigate the risks of the pandemic as time goes on. So we know some of the use of these technologies will be with us for some time. We worked alongside of the Department of Health and Social Care um, when they were developing the app. We don't approve, we don't, we don't give a pass to um, any technology, but we do act as a critical friend. And in this case, we did. We were pleased with the development of the app because it built privacy in. Anonymous data, um, voluntary use of the app, as well as control over reuse or function creep by preventing a back-end database. So all, all of these issues involving the regulator, talking to the regulator up front, and building in privacy are very important, um, very important considerations for small organizations, large organizations, government bodies. And the ICO is here to help is here to give you advice. So thank you for that. You know, that just reminds me, um, actually, I was wondering, Nima, uh, just in, in terms of, do you see these types of principles then guiding other government uh, governance issues for other governments as well when it comes to, to this type of technology use or deployment of such technologies? Yeah, that's a really good question, Ria. I think building on Elizabeth's comments, I, I, I do think it is important that we really seize this opportunity Think about how these core principles should um, be from a global perspective. Um, the reality is 96% of European nations have data protection or data privacy laws. But when you look at the global landscape, only 43% of the least developed nations have similar regulations in place. Um, and so I think there is, due to the borderless nature of technology, it does mean it's even more crucial that we can adopt a broader view what the fundamental principles should be that frame the parameters by which technologies can collect, use, monetize, and disseminate our data. Um, without this, there is the potential to exploit the most vulnerable communities and entrench the existing kind of digital divide that many speak of. Um, and I do think that there is um, an important basis for us to be able to think through if the principles that we're advocating for um, from a European perspective are just as applicable uh, around the world, nor can we distill um, those principles down so that we get to the to the minimal global standards. And I think everything Elizabeth said around you know, privacy by the SAM and, and really upfront uh, collaborative uh, and constructive dialogues between app developers and regulators is really crucial. Hmm. And I, I think what, one thing I wanted to, to, to raise here, uh, Mark, if I could bring you into to the points that Elizabeth and Nima have raised, is actually I, I want to share a personal example. So I was at, um, at a restaurant this past weekend, and um, I was really amazed to see the number of people who were walking in who were being asked by the restaurant to scan, uh, because the NHS app had gone live, to scan the QR code, the NHS uh, QR code, and how many of them didn't have the app downloaded, but um, didn't hesitate at all to be able to download the app then and there so that they could uh, scan the QR code and then, then come into the restaurant. And it, it just made me wonder um, that while the, these types of principles are being, uh, are being utilized in multiple countries to be able to monitor, if you will, what the excesses could be for the use of such technologies, um, I wondered, Mark, you know, from the public's perspective, do you think that when there is a time of an emergency, when it's being described as uh, a, a national need, that people are more willing to, to be open to the idea of a technology that could potentially be used, um, loosely speaking, for surveillance as well? So I, I think that the challenge here is that it's much easier to build trust in sort of times of peace than times of, times of war, for want of a, a better comparison. And if I compare this to sort of policing and national security, 
Um, there are a whole range of intrusive powers and surveillance, um, some using technology, some, um, some using other methods, um, and, and, and data plays an increasingly big part in that, of course. But that's grown up over time, and I think generally in democracies, the public have some sort of understanding. I think in the UK, people would have, had an, have an understanding that, I know, please can bug your house if you're involved in terrorism or pedophilia, but can't for shoplifting probably because it doesn't seem serious enough. And they won't know what the law is and what the rules are. They'll have a sense of that, and they'll have a sense that there's lots of people who oversee these things, that there's, there's various commissioners and inspectors and the courts. And so there's a process and a trust that's built in alongside a threat that people have an instinctive fear of and desire that the state does something about and so you've built that long term what we're trying to do now which is a wickedly difficult problem for governments is to start to deploy surveillance for health purposes in a way that is sort of completely beyond anything that's been done before and you're trying to do it for the first time in the middle of a crisis where um uh, sort of many many thousands of people are dying and that is a really difficult ask for anybody. And it's not surprising the debate and the public, the public opinion, public debate is going to be bumpy in that. Um, but I think so. What, what we've got to try and do is to see, so take those parallels and those lessons and think about how do you rapidly try and build that trust, build that understanding both about the threat and the methods used and all the safeguards around it. And whilst, I mean, when I loaded, downloaded the NHS app, it's sort of, very clear as you're sort of going through the signing on process. There's a there's a nice screen that goes to sort of what happens to your data and it's 14 days and all the rest of it and, and the anonymization point. Um, that's one point though. There's got to be lots of points in our system where we've got to try and catch up with a, a public understanding that well we don't do surveillance for health, do we? We do it for other things, and now we are doing it for health. People sort of get that it's necessary, but are bound to be nervous and want to understand the detail. And that's, I think, where we can look at, say, national security. I think, how do we catch up with what's been the ground that's covered in decades? How do we catch it up and do it quickly? And I think that's a great point. And it ties back to something, Elizabeth, you had said earlier, right, which is, in, in essence, the stickiness of, of this particular use of technology. So there is, a, there is initially an understanding with the deployment of these types of technologies that it is for that limited use in terms of this pandemic, this moment in time for, for, uh, for what we need. But then, as we've seen, and, and uh, Mark, you know this so well, you know, and, and uh, my memory is of right after September 11th, there was such a need, a, a real demand, if you will, that to keep us safe, the government needs to do what it needs to do. Now, with time, that changed in terms of the pressure that you know perhaps the government has overstepped its bounds. And I just wondered, I, I, from your perspective, actually, Mark, if I could just touch base with you on that again. Yeah. This very different in terms of, of what the what government use of technology has been in the past, or are there similarities either in terms of the deployment or in terms of the justification for why it's needed in the first place? I think that in the example you used, I think there's some difference between the UK and the US. I think because in the UK, and um, we've had sort of 50, 60 years of domestic terrorism pretty continuously with Irish related threats and Al Qaeda, ISIS, and there's some right wing threats as well thrown into the mix then that has meant more of a steady evolution of, of sort of counter-terrorism and security powers. Um, there wasn't one moment in the sand where there was a dramatic change in the system, as you saw in the States, mm. which is, is perhaps a more um, a more tricky time. I do think, though, that the sort of the point about the tools and tactics being proportionate to the threat is the key here. And mm. if this is a singular threat, then these tools and tactics need to be singular to that. And I guess we might want them on the shelf for future threats if pandemics are going to happen from time to time, as the experts seem to say. Um, mm. But it might not make sense to have them continually deployed as opposed to being sort of ready and in the wings to deploy in a, in a crisis. Um, but I think we'd say so that goes with, I think, public trust understanding what's the threat what are the reasonable tools and tactics that the state can use and what are the safeguards and systems around it that will mean that it's done properly and fairly? So I, I think that that's very, very helpful because if I can go back to my, my restaurant experience this, this past weekend. Um, so when I walked in, I didn't have my phone with me. 
And I almost didn't get served because she wanted me to scan the, the code. And so I volunteered um, and said, look, let me give you what, you know, I'll give you whatever information you need because I, I don't I don't have the, the phone. And so I have to admit, um, she just went and tore a piece of paper from somewhere and a notepad. And she was uh, not pleased because what she said to me, she said, look, I'm not doing this for us. It's for them. And she was actually pointing at the NH NHS code and making a point of saying this is we are doing this for the government. This is not something mm -hmm. that we are doing for us. Um, and that really made me wonder. I admit I didn't argue any further um, because I was hungry. Um, but it raised a very critical point in, in my mind, which was um, really is to say, you know, under the current law, uh, and, and Elizabeth, if I can turn back to you first, um, you know, what are the responsibilities of businesses that are either providing these technical solutions because they're, they're uh, businesses that are now creating apps um, that will, you know, formalize, if you will, the, the information taking, or they're physically collecting um, data, um, like like my uh, like my lovely restaurant friend. So oh, there's so much that we could talk about in your restaurant example, Ria, but um, because again, this is about choice. It's about transparency, fairness, proportionality, mm -hmm. and those points that Sir Mark just mentioned. But when it comes to businesses responsibility, you know, I would I would say that the security of the data that's collected in the QR code is more secure than the information about you and your contacts written down on a piece of paper. Because again, we know that the, the businesses don't actually have that data. They have the ability through the system to to actually notify you if there is some kind of an event that happens a case that breaks out at the restaurant so you know a proximity event but again choice really businesses have a responsibility to be transparent with their their customers with their employees they have the responsibility to secure the data but they also have the responsibility to collect limited amounts of information for the the purpose so those responsibilities have not changed what has changed in the context of covid is the public private partnerships in order to mitigate the risks of the pandemic and i think for example of supermarkets having to collect data on vulnerable individuals that um, were shielding so that they could actually provide food to them. So that's government data in that sense going to a business in order for the business to be able to provide the service. And again, our office was very was involved in that to give advice to make sure the least amount of information was collected for the purpose and the data was deleted at the end of the program. So all of those same principles and those same provisions are there. And when it comes to businesses that are providing apps, that are providing services, they have the responsibility of privacy by design as well. Um, and so it's businesses working in a, in a chain, in a system, so that public trust at the end of the day is maintained because if we lose public trust in this pandemic or any other situation we know that there will be a hit on the public's uptake and participation in these important services and these important provisions so public trust as sir mark has just said is fundamental and privacy is a big part of that and I just wondered, though, I mean, there, there's the role that that government is playing in terms of reassuring the, the public about how these technologies are being used. Then there is the role that the private sector is playing, both in terms of the deployment of these technologies or the creation of new apps that that mm -hmm. might formalize, if you will, the collection of some of this data. And I just, if, Nima, if I could turn back to you, is there any mm -hmm. further responsibility on the part of governments to help protect this new collection of data by by uh, by businesses because they're not doing it for themselves right or do you think current data protection regulations are enough to be able to address the concerns not of the public and their individual rights to privacy but rather the role this blurring of lines between the private and public sector 
at, at what point does there need to be new or innovative government protocols that help shape what it is that this new role that private sector companies are playing? That's a really good question. Um, I think there are a couple of points to highlight. One thing we need to understand and the forum has been uh, working on uh, over the last four and a half, five years is really thinking about what we conceptualize as the fourth industrial revolution as, as really being um, the pivot for us as a global society to think about how governance is longer government alone and that it really does need to be a multi-stakeholder um, focused um, initiative. And by this, it must require public-private collaboration to ensure that we are harnessing the power of emerging technologies, but also minimizing the negative effects and the risks on, on society. And so the work that we've been doing um, at the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution is providing that neutral platform where we can bring industry and government together alongside civil society and, and uh, academia to really think about how we're co-designing governance protocols and, and regulatory frameworks for emerging te technologies in a manner and I think this allows um, us to be able to um, provide that neutral platform but also enables corporates to call governments out if they do not implement the same policies and principles that they have co-designed um, and the same standards that they expect of industry um, I think it's important to try and keep ourselves honest in this exercise technology innovation is so rapid um, to some you know at a pace that is uh, beyond most people's comprehension. But ultimately, I think there are a few things that are key to this, and they've both been raised by Elizabeth and Mark. First and foremost, the question of trust. And I think this is a really, really um, important issue because ultimately um, where um, we see that um, there is misinformation, it erodes trust. Um, and, and it's important for corporates to be really as transparent about um, their privacy by design uh, positions or focusing on human-centered design as, as it is governments. And what's interesting here, just anecdotally, is um, Endelman uh, does a trust barometer report every every year. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that's really interesting right now about the report they released back in January is of um, the statistics that they, they find, found from their survey, um, they found that of in, the informed public, 70% uh, uh, trusted businesses compared to 59% trusted government and when that translates into the mass population 55% um, trusted business whereas 47% trusted uh, government and so I think that should be a wake-up call that when it comes to regulation it really does have to be multi-stakeholder the other thing I would uh, just flag is on Elizabeth's point about public accountability I think this is a really important way for corporate to future-proof themselves. Um, and I think, again, we've touched on transparency as well. What we're seeing is that businesses are at the forefront of technology innovation, but at the same time, um, they need to be able to foster trust by being transparent. And I think in countries where they've deployed contact tracing apps like Ireland and Germany and uh, shared the source code, um, before they did the launch and, and were very good at informing the general public about the parameters of um, the capabilities, particularly when it comes to surveillance issues, have had a greater uptake um, because they are being very transparent at the outset and saying, look, we're not trying to, you know, do some backdoor activities where we're tracking you and, and monitoring you. So I do think it is important when uh, apps are developed and governments are then leveraging those third party apps that they're able to be super transparent and, and foster that trust. In the same way, it's a two way street. The corporates who are developing the, these apps also have an ethos themselves. And I think this is particularly important with the Google Apple API, which has had a lot of back and forth because there I think um, a company like Apple that has been very uh, vocal about um, trans, uh, about privacy, right? Uh, about the privacy by design. Um, I'm sure everybody remembers the, the case between FBI and Apple in relation to the San Bernardino um, terrorist attack from a few years ago. I think they put, you know, state a claim saying we are very much privacy by design driven uh, and, and user uh, focused. And so I think that sets a barometer for um, governments if they are working with those companies, but also gives the corporates the power to be able 
peacekeepers in check where they've agreed something at the outset and then the governments have decided or for various reasons to change their position later on for those companies right. to be able to come back to this. Okay, so on that note, with regard to transparency and the building of trust, there, there's a, to me, there's that third point that, that you have all raised, actually, uh, throughout the conversation, which is about the concept or the, the, the idea of consent. And, and Mark, I remember, you know, um, if this was something you had specifically raised as well, which is yeah. the need to get consent. But I think it might be helpful for us to really understand what is meant by that term, because um, many of us who easily check, accept on all the privacy policy um, you know, pop-ups that come up uh, on every website we visit, the intent is there. Um, I'm just curious from your perspective, if you see consent in, in a specific way, especially through the use of these types of technologies and measures. I think the idea of um, what I would call true consent, um, I think is the is the key to this. And certainly in a, sort of, in a, in a criminal context that gets um, tested if a police officer's trick somebody out of some evidence and it wasn't a true consent then a case can a case can fall case can fall over um i think i remember hearing a sort of year or so ago about um somebody doing an experiment just to prove that these a lot of these license agreements that people sign up to are are, are, are too big and complicated and never read i think someone inserted mm. in them some awful phrase about i consent to the, I know, the murder of my entire family or something ridiculous and it didn't mm -hmm. reduce the the um, sign up rate one one iota which sort of illustrates that you actually have to work hard at achieving the understanding and the consent it isn't it shouldn't just be a checkbox process that mm -hmm. is not accessible unless you've got a sort of degrees in probably both technology and law most of these agreements aren't understandable anyway um yeah. i actually sort of um thought the the uk government app when i turned up turned up the sort of the one page on the phone of probably about 50 or 100 words that tries to summarize mm. what you're signing up to in terms of data i thought that was really good and then there's something you can go to and then you can go to hundreds of pages if you want if you want to dive into it but at least it it has an attempt at making something digestible to people who aren't technologists and that's that's um that's really powerful um I think the problem here, one of the problems here is about people understanding the technology. I've been struck recently in policing as in the UK, we have a lot of CCTV and the public are happy with that. And there's codes of practice and Elizabeth and her team are involved with that. And there's a fairly sensible regime about it. As the police start looking to deploy facial recognition, that yeah. generates a whole different level of intrusion. And there's been a lot of conversation in the media about trying to work out what's reasonable in that and i think there's a sense that actually if if, the, if companies or the police were using facial recognition to effectively track people all over the country that would feel massively intrusive but what the police have been trying to say is that all we want to do is to use it we've got thousands of people who are wanted for serious criminal offenses rather than pretending a police officer can memorize all those faces why not have a device that helps that police officer spot somebody who might be one of those wanted people and the person doesn't get arrested because the computer decides it the computer flagability to an officer who then makes a decision so you're helping mm. human beings do better and mm. you're restricting the intrusion to trying to find dangerous people uh, but sort of, that is immediately an order of magnitude of complexity higher than mm. the classic old ctv which people sort of understand that it's fairly anonymous unless somebody dives into it and watches it because a particular case has happened so you've got cases like that which we've grown to understand we don't yet have an instinctive social understanding of what health surveillance looks like, what these apps mean. And I think there's been a, a decent start of communicating that, but there's so far, so far to go. And you can understand why people are nervous about it. And I think that's a really helpful point about, especially about the communication piece, right? The intent can be there, but the question is, how is it being communicated? And, and in terms of how does that then help deepen trust? Um, you know, one of the things that actually uh, one of the audience members had asked was with regard to the, the point that you raised, uh, Nima, earlier about how um, there are statistics clearly showing that the public tends to trust commercial entities, uh, mm -hmm. whether that be the ones that are providing home security or, um, or other elements of technology, um, why they are more trusted than government. And, and are there any measures that governments can take to further um, it, it, to further change it so that it, it really does become about deepening um, the, the trust in government efforts. Is it purely down to communication about what this technology is, or are there any active measures that should be taken? Um, I don't know if any of you have a point of view on that. 
And, and perhaps that goes back to your point, Elizabeth, about descaling or, or you know, decommissioning, if you will. Um, and if so, is it important to communicate that from the very beginning? Uh, Elizabeth, do you have a view on? Yes, I think when I when I talk about transparency, I'm talking about it quite broadly. So I I agree with what Sir Mark has said about consent being a concept that is really stretched when it comes mm -hmm. to internet technologies. And so um, having pages and pages and pages of an agreement that a user is signing up to, that's more like privacy theater than it is really about transparency. And so the modernized data protection law doesn't just recognize consent as being one um, legal basis. It's one legal basis. It's not, it's not everything. The police do not need to get consent to collect um, facial recognition technology. They have a whole lot of other standards that they have to achieve. Like, is it reasonable? Are there safeguards? Are they actually deploying this use of technology only when it's absolutely needed? So those are other provisions. And, and I agree that consent and the kind of transparency around that doesn't, doesn't work. And it doesn't work well in new applications, but layered notices do. So Sir Mark used the example of the good one page notification for the app. And then if people want more information, they can go further. But people also want an agency that has sound data governance throughout, that it's an accountable organization. And the public also wants somebody to have their back. So they trust systems that are audited. They trust systems that have been evaluated by a regulator. They trust mm -hmm. systems where there hasn't been a data breach because that, that equals a loss of trust for everybody. So it's, mm -hmm. it's more complicated than just a notice. It's about transparency and communication. And I think, I think government's done a good job when it comes to the contact tracing app. What's going to be more difficult is the iterations and changes to the app. So as we start moving into different requirements, such as immunity passports, for example, there'll have to be a whole, there'll be much more communication needed for people to understand it. So it's a nuanced area, but transparency means more than just a privacy notice. Yeah, and I think that, that really, Go ahead, Mark. Can I just come in there, just on, on the sort of trust issue and picking up sort of on Elizabeth's point and the point that Neil made earlier. I'm not sure I agree that the private sector is trusted more than government. Um, I think it depends what data you look at. And sort of, I, it's caused me to sort of look back and confirm my memory from the sort of regular Ipsos Mori data on trust in different professions. And mm -hmm. sort of politicians and journalists are always at the bottom. Not far behind are actually business leaders. Um, at the top tend to be medical profession, judiciary, um, uh, uh, policing, um, armed forces, civil servants, etc. So um, it depends what, when you ask the question government, what bit of government do you mean? Do you mean the sort of the machine of civil servants and police and doctors and nurses, or do you mean politicians? And you get very different answers from the public. And actually on the sort of this, I think UK data, business leaders come um, uh, a long way, a long way down. So. I don't think we should sort of beat up the state in terms of the level of trust, but that's not to say this is a massive challenge to sustain that trust into this complex area which people struggle to understand. So do you see a discrepancy then between what you were talking about earlier, Nima, or do you think that the, the two kind of dovetail depending on uh, how you break down the, the trust issue, if you will? Um, I think it's very, I encourage everyone to to, to cut and look at the Endelman um, Trust Barometer, and, and they set out their methodology for for how they've calculated this. And I, I I don't know if they have broken it down in that way. They they look at public sector more generally. Um, I would say that this for me shows two things. Right, first that um, in a pandemic context, when governments uh, um, should move quickly about not only their understanding of technology, but able to put in place the policies and regulations needed to make sure that they can be deployed. Uh, they are able to move quickly and it 
thing that we've been talking about uh, at the World Economic Forum around agile governance. And so I do think that the government has sh has shown governments more generally that where they have needed to step up and be more agile in their in their thinking about regulating uh, emerging technologies, they they have been uh, improving on previous occasions. But at the same time, it doesn't change the narrative that when we talk about innovation more generally, that's driven by industry. More often than not, corporates are at the forefront of technology innovation. And so I think for us, we're being super frank with each other. The reality today is that it has to be a shared one. And that's why we're very much encouraging of multi-stakeholder collaboration, particularly driven by private uh, cooperation because technology is something that you know is borderless as I said earlier and therefore that responsibility should be shouldered between both drivers are responsible and ultimately accountable society and citizens uh, which is government and those that are at the forefront of technology innovation which is private sector and what we have seen is that that relationship has, is going down the right track of coordination and greater collaboration but we're not at the final destination yet where it's seamless um, mm -hmm. and I think we're going to have some growing pains as we iterate um, through this pandemic. Yeah so to continue on, on this theme thank you for that I think what that builds to is, is going back to the question about trust right and and one of the questions from the audience uh, I don't think we will be surprised um, uh, because this is something that has just you know come up recently is with regard to forgive me I'm pulling it up right now is um, is of course with regard to this report from the BBC that you know police officers have been told not to download the COVID uh, track and trace app on their work phones um, and it's allegedly for security reasons although that's not necessarily uh, the the reason as far as I know, but I just wondered if in terms of trust, even a story like that goes a long way towards raising questions about privacy. And I just wondered, um, perhaps Mark or Elizabeth or Nima, uh, if any of you view on that, um, both in terms of this story, but just in terms of how one then counters such um, allegations, if you will, um, if you are sitting in, in, in the government seat as well. I, mean, I would come in. So I, I don't know the full detail behind it. And I do think a story like that is worrying and simply in the way it presents because it's it's not very well explained. And it, suggest, it has an implication between the lines that the police don't trust the app. And I'm sure that's not the case, but it has that implication, which is which mm. I think is problematic. Um, I imagine the case to be, um, we are paying police officers like other emergency services to go into all sorts of situations um, and there is a different risk assessment process around them. There's different health protection measures. There's a whole load of policy work I know my sort of former colleagues have dealt with. And the infection risk to officers on duty has been dealt with a particular way. And I imagine sort of the experts within policing have looked at it and talked to the government saying actually using the app to overlay that will cause more confusion than it will do benefit. And therefore actually using it in the workplace rather than using it in your, in your personal life doesn't, doesn't make sense. I do think, though, it needs properly explaining by representatives of the police service and government to get past this sort of um, unhelpful inference that's in the article. Okay, that, that's very helpful as well. And and I think this this also raises, you know, there are going to be nation specific questions that arise in terms of the technologies that are being used. Mm. But I just wondered, you know, most of these efforts around the pandemic have really focused on national approaches. And at what point then do we need to transfer that into something that is a broader understanding, um, whether that's cross-regional, whether that's uh, multilateral, um, in terms of understanding what are the principles uh, that should really drive a broader global understanding of what these technologies uh, mean or what the pandemic means in terms of what governments and private sector need to do. Uh, and I wondered, Nima or Elizabeth, if you know, uh, perhaps Elizabeth, we start with you because of the work that you're doing with the Global Privacy Assembly, as an example, about um, how at a, an international group level these these discussions are being had. And then uh, Nima, I'd like to turn to you after that as well. Sure. Can you see me or hear me, Elizabeth? Oh, Ria, I, I can't quite I can't quite hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Let, let me just repeat the, the first part of my question, which was in, in terms of the, the work that you're doing with the Global Privacy Assembly uh, and the work that you're doing with other information commissioners and data protection authorities, are there efforts, should there be efforts to, to discuss more uh, uh, standards that are more uh, that are broader than at the national level? 
And if so, how? Uh, absolutely. I mean, we are, um, we actually used our convening power, the ICO uses convening power to bring together um, privacy and data protection commissioners from around the world, because a lot of us are dealing with the same challenges, the scramble and the clamor to use technology in ways that will help mitigate the risks and, and test and, and trace the population. So all of these same questions are coming up around the world and none of us has, um, has all the information that we need. We're learning from others. I found it really interesting to find out from our, our South Asian colleagues about the way that they were rolling out new technologies given the kind of infrastructure there is in Korea and Singapore and other areas because of their experience with the SARS epidemic. So we learned a lot from Southeast Asia, but we also have different laws and different cultures. So it's important to have this dialogue with regulators around the world. And we, we've been able to put out statements, principles and standards. We have a detailed um, for privacy by apps. And that work was done very quickly and under the gun because all of us needed to answer questions from our government. I do think we'll go to a place where there, there will be international standards around public health surveillance. We're not there yet, but we certainly are learning from this experience. Thank you. That, that's very helpful. In, you know, in the remaining couple of minutes that we have, Nima, perhaps you can, if you can share with us at the multilateral level, are there any efforts or should there be efforts? And then I'd love to, to give the last word to Sir Mark as well uh, in terms of the, the final thoughts that you may have. Sure, I'll be really brief. Um, and so just building on Elizabeth's comments, I do think uh, it is really, really important that we are able to develop international legal standards for data protection. Um, I think the initiative that she mentioned is, is, is a starting point. And certainly the work that we're doing at the World Economic Forum Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution Network is meant to really amplify that, um, to essentially distill what would be global principles for how we govern emerging technologies, whether it's recognition, AI, or it is using drones in, uh, in the health context to deliver bloods and medicines to uh, urban or rural communities. I do think that we need to take a much more global approach when it comes to technology regulation, particularly um, those uh, that are really, really important and impactful for society writ large. Um, of course, we need to take into account the legal nuances per at, at the national level. Um, but um, but yeah, definitely look at the work that we're doing in this space. That sounds great. And Mark, from your perspective, is, is there anything as a sort of a, a parting thought uh, in terms of the discussion that we've had that you would like to share with us as well? Uh, my, my last thought is that sort of whilst none of us would want to be um, wrestling with what the world is wrestling with at the moment with the pandemic, uh, the disturbance it's creating does give us some opportunities and one opportunity is around technology. We're using technology in wholly new ways. Um, we're learning to use it differently. We're learning it both in terms of its functionality and regulation. Uh -huh. If we can use that in the right constructive way, then it can open doors to a million and one different ways we can use technology in the future to transform public services and particularly transform health. We all know with all the wearables and other technologies coming to health, the potential to have a, a, a massive upturn in the ability of the uh, of the state and of pr the private sector to help people um, nurture and develop their own health um, is enormous. And this may help us perversely take a step in that direction whilst we'd rather not be wrestling with it. And I think on that very positive note, I just want to thank each and every one of you for your insights and, and for your, your guidance, really. As you all mentioned, this is really a pivotal moment in human history, if you will, in the evolution of technology and the use of it. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a challenge as much as it is an opportunity for how it is that we are evolving both the use of the technology, but just as important, how do we hold on to the fundamental standards, the, the fundamental principles, which, which really um, are the focus of the, of the efforts that all of you are involved in. So I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you, and um, thank you to the audience as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ria. Thank you. Thanks.